and mute. Okay, so I'm on, uh, we on script sharing, so we're gonna start. I'm gonna do a small intro of our guest tonight. So welcome everyone to uh, our public lectures tonight. It's my true pleasure to introduce uh, our speakers, uh, Dr. Daniel Whitson, Whitson uh, from uh, UC Irvine. Uh, if you've ever taken my classes, uh, you've been introduced to him as the author of uh, the podcast, Daniel Jorge Explained the Universe, but I would not do Daniel justice if I was not to give at least a little bit of background. So from what I gathered is that he decided to become a theoretical physicist growing up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, uh, where he decided that anything practical would not be his forte. <laughs> he graduated from uh, UC Berkeley in 2003, uh, did a postdoc in UPenn as a Nittany Lion myself. Um, I can see, uh, I can appreciate the P Pennsylvania uh, uh, yes, link. I believe that uh, you joined UC, UC Irvine in 2007 when you, where you are a professor of physics and astronomy with a particular interest in uh, high energy physics, uh, where you are part of the collaboration, the CDF collaboration with the Fermilab Tevatron, as well as a member of the ATLAS collaboration on the Large Hadron Col uh, Collider at CERN. One tidbit I did not know until uh, today is that you are actually the author of uh, the Crayfish, uh, Crayfish app. So, and, and the app that allows you to use a phone camera to detect ultra high energy uh, cosmic ray. Um, and you, several years ago, you befriended a uh, Caltech PhD, PhD comic creator, and fellow introvert. And together, as it seems to be the natural thing to do, you created, in my opinion, the best science po podcast out there called We Have No Idea. In doing so, you also are the author of uh, two books, We Have No Idea, and Frequently Asked Questions About the Universe. Uh, two books to tell us everything that science does not explain so far. So it's really my uh, true pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Whiteson to uh, our public lectures, and I will yield the floor and let you start. Well, thank you very much for that flattering introduction. I hardly recognize uh, who you're describing there, but it's my pleasure to be here uh, this evening and to, to be hosted um, so graciously and to talk to you about my curiosity about the universe. Um, tonight, what I wanna do is tell you about all of the things that physics doesn't yet understand, which means the biggest things, the coldest things, the hottest things, the smallest things, the fastest things, and the slowest things. So basically everything. And I can't talk about all of that in one evening. So I'm gonna focus on the thing that I particularly spend my life on. I've devoted my professional career that I have the strongest burning curiosity to understand, which is the tiniest things in the universe. And you might wonder like, how does somebody end up deciding to spend their life trying to understand the tiniest bits of the universe? Well, for me, it started when I was a kid and I wanted to explore the world. I thought the age of exploration was a really glamorous time when people were discovering new continents. People were walking on beaches for the first time. You know, imagine being the first person to ever see the Grand Canyon, like the first human being. You've walked across the land bridge from Asia. You've walked down the Western coast of the United States and you see the Grand Canyon and wow, what a moment, right? And I wanted that. I wanted to be the first person to eat some fruit or to taste something or to be somewhere or to know something. But as a kid, when you're learning about exploration, it feels sort of used up. I mean, people, people have been all around the world. We have satellites that have imaged every tiny square inch. There's no more islands to discover and name after your Chihuahua, right? It seems sort of over. And, and more than that, it's not just that we have explored the world, but it feels like we have understood it very well. You know, think about everything that our technology has accomplished. You know, we have these incredible devices 
these airplanes that could take you around the world in hours, these devices that fit in your pocket, um, which you can download all of human knowledge. Um, even, you know, we have incredible advances in fast food technology. So you might be forgiven for thinking that we have the universe mostly figured out, that physics is basically wrapped up except for a couple of little details. But I discovered, and I want to share with you tonight, a different perspective. And that's that actually the exact opposite is true, that most of the universe remains undiscovered. And if, and if like me, you are burning with the desire to discover something new, to be on the forefront of knowledge, to be the first person to understand something, there's a huge amount of exploration left to do in this universe. So what am I talking about? What kind of exploration is left? Because after all, you can just use Google Earth. You don't have to get in a boat and sail around the world. What kind of questions are unanswered? Well, they're, they're really the kind of the best kind of questions, the questions I would call big fat questions, by which I mean, these are questions that if you knew the answer to them, it might change the way you live your life. It might change the whole context of human existence. You know, the kind of questions that you walk down the street, you ask a random person, not a scientist, just like a random person, what's the biggest question? What's the most important question? Well, if you did that, they might say things like this. Uh, why are we here? Or what happens after we die, right? Like if you knew for a fact exactly what happened after death, it might change the way you live your life, right? Absolutely. And you know, the, the issue with these questions that the, is that these are philosophy questions. These are questions that are fun to explore and maybe they teach you something because you're asking the question. You don't always necessarily find an answer. And you know, the most famous qu question in all of philosophy is this one, what is it like to be a bat? And I'm like not making fun of philosophy here. That's literally the title of the most widely cited paper in all of philosophy. And the answer is no one will ever know, which I guess is the point of philosophy that nobody ever finds answers. The thing that excites me though, even though these questions are fun to talk about, and I love philosophy, is that there are other questions that are at the same level, the questions that are as exciting, questions that are as dramatic and important but these are science questions, questions like, what is everything made out of? And how did the universe begin? And when I say they're science questions, what I mean is there's an answer. There's an objective truth. The universe began in one way and in no other way. And if you knew the true history of the first moments of the universe or the fact that it went back in time to negative infinity, that might change the way you live your life. And how you decide to spend it and then what it means to you. So there are big fat questions that remain unanswered that if we knew the answer to would change the way we felt about life. I mean, I think in a thousand years, people might know the answer to these questions and they will look back at us and they'll wonder like, wow, what was it like to live back then when we were so ignorant of the way things work? What was it like? How could it possibly be a human being without understanding these things? The same way that we look back at cavemen and cave women who looked up at the stars having no idea what they were seeing. What was it like to be so ignorant? Well, we are still that ignorant today. So unfortunately, we can't explore all of the open questions of the universe. So let's just focus on this one. What is the universe made out of? What are the tiniest little bits, the elements of the universe? I think this is a pretty reasonable question to want to know the answer to. And I think it's an old question. You know, I think people have been asking this question since people have been asking questions, you know? I mean, when I was a kid, I literally took rocks and smashed them together to make smaller rocks and did that again and again and again and wondered, I literally remember wondering, at some point, does it stop being a rock and turn into something else? Is there a minimum rock size or can you go on forever making tiny and tinier rocks? So maybe it's not surprising that I became a, a particle physicist. But, you know, <clears throat> think about it. What if you were the first person to ever think about this question? Say you were this caveman or cavewoman scientist. How would you tackle the question of what is everything made out of? It's a hard question. And if we're going to, you know, be curious about the universe, we have to have a plan for how to dive into these things. And so one simple thing to do, maybe not the best thing, but the first thing you might try is just look at what's in the universe and make a list, right? Start with a list. So you're caveman, cavewoman physicist, you're trying to understand what the universe is made out of. 
you make a list. So I'm in the universe, you're in the universe. There's a rock over there, there's another rock over there. Pretty soon you discover, wow, there's lots of different kinds of rocks in the universe, right? There's a wide variety of rocks. And as you keep looking, you discover this question has a lot of complexity to it because the universe has a lot of complexity to it, right? It's not just rocks. There's mushrooms, there's leaves, there's blueberries, there's ice cream, there's all sorts of crazy stuff in the universe. The more you look, the more you're overwhelmed by the variety of stuff in the universe. How is it possible that there's so many different kinds of things in the universe, right? That's amazing. It's incredible, the almost infinite variety. Now, you don't just make a list. A list is useless because a list doesn't give you any insight. A list doesn't tell you what's going on underneath. It's not a, a simplification. It's not a reduction. So what we want to do is we want to peel back a layer of reality and say, what's really going on? We want to get a deeper insight. And that doesn't come from a list. Instead, it comes from finding patterns and organizing things. The patterns in the, that we see will lead to questions that will help reveal what's going on deeper down. So, you know, you put stuff together, you can say, I don't know, does Arnold Schwarzenegger belong in the thing category or in the rock category? It doesn't matter as long as everything has a category. And you start to notice these patterns. Those patterns lead exactly to those questions. Why are there some shiny things and some less shiny things? And so we can't spend the whole evening talking about the history of science. So let me fast forward a little bit for you. But over thousands of years, we've developed this incredible picture that almost everything you have eaten or tasted or tripped over or thrown at your sibling is made out of about 100 basic building blocks, right? The elements of the periodic table. And you might be wondering, hold on a second, that sounds to me like high school chemistry. I thought we were talking about you know, cutting edge particle physics. Why are we hearing about high school chemistry? Well, I think this is a really underrated intellectual achievement of humanity. You know, that we went from like a huge variety, almost infinite complexity, that we're able to explain that in just like a hundred basic building blocks, that's mind blowing, right? Why is that even possible? It tells you something deep about the universe that complexity comes from the arrangement of stuff, not from the nature of things themselves. You know, it's almost like we live in a Lego universe, right? Where you can have a few basic building blocks and from those building blocks, you can build up anything you like, right? You can make dinosaurs, you can make pirates, you can make ice cream, you can make lava. It's amazing that we live in that kind of universe. If you're a caveman or cavewoman physicist and you're not sure how the universe works, you still have to consider like other possible universes. Like maybe it would have been possible that we lived in a universe where every kind of thing was made out of its own stuff, right? The reason cats are so weird is because they're, way to, they're made out of interesting, fascinating, weirdly unique cat stuff. And I'm made out of my own Daniel stuff and llamas are made out of llama stuff, right? But we don't live in that universe. We don't live in a universe where your identity and your behavior and your properties are determined by the, the identity of the thing you're made out of, but instead by their arrangement. Right? Because you have a small number of basic building blocks explain an infinite complexity of things. But we don't stop there. We don't say, hey, look, we got 100 basic building blocks. We're done. Right? We don't make a list and call it a day. We want to peel back another layer of reality. We want to see what's going on underneath. And the way we do that is, again, we organize our knowledge and we look for patterns. And the periodic table, of course, is periodic, right? There are patterns. There's metals and there's non-metals and there's stuff that's active and stuff that's not active. And you look at it and you're like, hmm, that's interesting. Why is that? And now, it, of course, we know that the questions that come to mind when you look at these patterns, the immediate questions, the answers to those questions come from the structure of what's going on in each of these elements, right? That the way that the electrons fill their orbital shells or don't fill them the way all those interactions happen is what determines whether something is shiny or not, or active or inactive or radioactive or not, right? All these things come from the internal structure. And so again, we see that looking around, making a list, organizing what you know, asking questions about the patterns that you see is the recipe for revealing a layer of truth that's deeper than what you can just see around you. And we've done that even further, right? We've gone inside the nucleus. Here we have a nucleus with protons and neutrons surrounded by electrons. Inside the neutrons, of course, are quarks. Um, there are up quarks and down quarks, which make up protons and neutrons. And so here we are with just three particles now. 
the up quarks and the down quarks, which make, which make up protons and neutrons. And you put those together with some electrons and you can make any of the 100 plus elements, which means that now we can do something even more amazing. Instead of explaining the incredible variety of the universe with 100 basic elements, we can do it with just three different things. With the electron, the up quark, and the down quark, you can make anything. Like if you asked me to write a recipe book, every recipe would have the same ingredients and in basically the same proportions, right? What's the difference between a one pound pecan pie and a one pound steak? Not in the ingredients, it's in the arrangements. If you could, in theory, you could rearrange all the up quarks and down quarks and electrons to convert a pecan pie into a steak or into lava, right? or into a kilogram of neutron star. It's all made out of the same stuff. And that again reveals something really deep about the universe. It tells you that the, the nature, the thing that makes you, you is not the stuff you're made out of, but how that stuff is put together. And I think it's really interesting to think about how long we have known this. How long have we had even this idea of a particle well, the discovery of particles dates back only about 150 years to the electron. J.J. Thompson was playing with cathode rays and he was shooting these rays through a vacuum chamber and bending them with magnets and with electric fields. And he discovered this, that, that these cathode rays, if you can bend them, then the mass and the charge move together. You can't separate the mass and the charge. And he had this idea that's, like, hmm, that's interesting. What if there's this like, dot of stuff that has properties, call it mass and charge, and they're sort of look, linked together. This is like a little unit of the universe um, that carries these, these properties with it. And that's why you can't separate the mass and the charge. And the, he gave it a terrible name, corpuscule. Uh, fortunately, he was overruled later and we call them now electrons, or we'd all be saying, you know, corpuscular uh, fields and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, but that was, you know, really the beginning of this idea of particles. And then later, of course, came Rutherford, his discovery of the nucleus. He was shooting alpha particles at thin gold foil. And most of the time it went through and was a little bit bent, but occasionally it bounced off of something really hard inside that gold foil and shot almost straight back. He famously said something like, it was like shooting a bullet at a tissue paper and having it reflect off. Um, so that's fascinating discovery. And you know, so, so around the same time, mid turn of the century, we discovered that light also was kind of a particle. Like now we have this idea, okay, a particle is like a tiny little dot of, of the universe stuff. It's like a little bit of matter. But then Einstein discovered that he could interpret the photoelectric effect to say that photons were particles. You know, you shine light at a piece of metal and electrons will fly off. And if light is just made out of waves, then as you cr increase the amount of light, you'd expect to get more electrons. But that didn't happen, weirdly. What happened was that if you increase the frequency of the light, you didn't get more electrons, but you got higher energy electrons. So the number of electrons didn't seem to depend on the intensity of the light at all, but it did, and the energy depended on the frequency. This took a long time to understand. It was Einstein who put this together and said, oh, well, maybe light isn't a continuous wave. Maybe it's made out of chunks. And each electron can actually just get one chunk of light energy. And that's why it doesn't matter. You don't get more electrons when you increase the number of photons because each one can just absorb one photon. But they do get more energy when you increase the energy of the photon. So this is this moment when we're like, okay, let's expand the definition of a particle to now also include a photon. That's really weird because the photon doesn't have any mass. So now a particle is like, hmm, it used to be something that had mass and charge, and now it's something that maybe doesn't have mass or charge. Uh, we're still confused today, honestly, about what a particle is. You ask 10 particle physicists, what is a particle? You get 10 different answers. But we kept discovering more of them. Um, you know, decades later, we discovered the positron and the muon um, by looking at how particles curve in magnetic fields and seeing ones that curve in ways that we couldn't explain with a list of particles that we already knew. And after we discovered a bunch of particles sort of out there in the world, we decided let's make colliders. Let's bring more energy into these collisions and try to break stuff apart. You know, if I said to you, how would you like to understand what things are made out of? You might say, I'll take it apart. You know, like if I have a toaster, 
how do I know what a toaster is made? I take it out into little bits and I say, oh, look, uh, it's made out of springs and bolts and screws and all sorts of stuff. That's cool. But a particle physicist doesn't want to take one thing apart. They want to smash things together. And so imagine, for example, if you had like a toaster collider, how would that work? Well, you might, you know, get these toasters to really high energy and smash them together and look at the stuff that came out. And you might get like, you know, two handles and six screws. And you'd imagine that everything that went into the collision has to come out of the collision, right? That it's just like what comes out is a rearrangement of what went in. And you think of it like a puzzle, like how do I figure out where these things came from? But when we do particle collisions at the Large Hadron Collider, that's not true. Like what happens is the particles come in. So here you have, for example, a proton and antiproton. They can annihilate. It means that they are totally destroyed. They, their matter is converted into something else, into pure energy, this intermediate particle, like a photon or a Z or something else, which then converts into some new kind of particle. So there's no connection between the stuff that comes out and the stuff that goes in. The stuff that comes out is not a rearrangement of the stuff that goes in. It's not like you know, chemistry where you're moving an electron from here to over there. You've annihilated this matter. You've destroyed it and you have poured that energy into a new kind of matter. This is alchemy, right? This is like turning lead into gold. We are literally doing alchemy every single time we collide particles in, in these devices. And you might think at first, wow, that's a huge disadvantage. Isn't that a big um, source of confusion because you have no knowledge, you have no idea what's gonna come out? It's actually one of the most powerful advantages of looking for, uh, of exploring the universe using particle colliders, because it means you don't have to know what you're looking for in order to make it, right? And you can take advantage of the fact, you can take advantage of E equals MC squared. So you take particles that you know that are fairly light, like not, don't have a lot of mass, and you make them go really, really fast, and you can convert that energy of those particles' speed into something new, something really heavy that's now slow moving. So you turn this energy into mass, and you don't have to like be able to take the Volkswagen Beetle apart and rearrange it to build these trucks. You just turn its energy into something new. And you know, the universe, when you have these collisions, because it's quantum mechanical, every single time you do it, you get something different. And so if something is out there, if something exists on nature's menu and you put enough energy into your collider, you will see whatever is there. So it's this wonderful, fabulous way to explore what's out there in the universe. And around the middle of last century, people started building these things, cyclotrons and synchrotrons and getting higher and higher energy. And it was like every time they turned on one of these things, they discovered a new particle or two. So we call this era of particle physics the particle zoo, because they just discovered so many particles. And you know, it used to be like, how many particles are there? There's electron, there's the neutron, there's the proton, there's like a handful. Now this is so many, like you have to give them crazy names, like X3823. It's like we're discovering planets, right? So around then we had so many particles, nobody even really knew what to do with them. And people, of course, started to look for patterns. You don't just make a list of the particles and say, here's all the particles we've ever found. You say, are there patterns? So pretty soon people discovered <clears throat> that there were patterns. That if you organized all these particles, these deltas and sigmas and cascades and omegas um, in certain ways, you could discover patterns. And it made a lot more sense if actually all these particles we had seen were a combination of smaller bits we call quarks. So there was the up quark, the down quark, and the strange quark. And you could mix those particles together in various combinations to explain all of the particle zoo. It was this incredible moment, right? We had all this craziness we didn't understand, and boom, it comes together. Now we've peeled back a layer of reality and seen what's going on underneath. And then people went on to discover more quarks. So here's, for example, um, data that led to a Nobel Prize. I love looking at particle discoveries or discoveries and saying like, what is the figure in the paper that actually led to the Nobel Prize? So here are figures in two competing papers that led to the discovery of the charm quark. This is an amazing story because there was a team at MIT led by Sam Ting, and they, they were doing an experiment to look for the, charge, <clears throat> for the charm quark 
And it was a difficult experiment and they didn't have a whole lot of energy, a whole lot of rate in their beam. So they were like accumulating events from the charm cork at a very slow level. Like over a year, they started to have this peak form. So you see this figure on the left, this is data from their spectrometer. And they're looking for a peak, something that shows that like there's some particle there. And it very slowly was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Meanwhile, at Stanford on the West Coast, right, there were folks who were who had were using an accelerator at Stanford. And the thing about the accelerator is it could discover a particle in an afternoon if you knew where to look. You have to tune this thing to just the right energy to see this bump. So they had scanned a big range, taking steps at different energies, and they missed it. Right? They didn't see it. Now, somehow or another, they knew exactly where to look one day. They turned the thing on and they saw this bump. And you see this plot on the right, this very dramatic bump. They did the study, they collected the data, they wrote the paper the next day. They had a press conference the following day. Coincidentally, exactly the same day that the MIT folks announced their results. So now you have competing press conferences, competing results across the country. And the two of them named this particle. This particle is a combination of two charm quarks. They gave it different names. Sam Ting named it the J particle and Bert Richter at Slack named it the Psi particle. And so today we call it the J Psi particle because nobody can agree on who discovered it first. And there's a lot of rumors about leaks from Sam Ting's group leading to the discovery at Stanford. So that was the discovery of the charm quark. Later, we discovered the bottom quark. And this is in the 1970s. And so at this point, we had five quarks. We had the up, the down, the strain, the charm, and the bottom. And five is sort of a weird number in physics. People really suspected there must be a sixth quark out there. And it took another 20 years before the top quark was discovered at the Large Hadron Collider. Here you can see the data that led to that discovery. So finally, we have this set of particles. We have six quarks, up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. We have the electron, and we also have more particles that are like the electron. We have these other particles, we call them all leptons. There's the muon, which is like the electron. There's the tau, which is like a heavier version. And then there are three neutrinos, which we'll get into in a minute. And just about 10 years ago, we discovered the last piece of the standard model, which is the Higgs boson. Discovered the Large Hadron Collider in 2012. This is the particle which interacts with all the other particles in the universe and makes them move as if they had mass. And we could talk about the Higgs boson all evening. But I want to get back to this rogues gallery of particles because it's sort of weird. It makes you wonder, like, why are these, all these particles? What do they do? Why are, you know, what properties do they have? So again, we don't just make a list and say, well, we got these particles, that's it. We make a table. We organize them and we look for patterns, right? That's the recipe for getting insight. And we notice a lot of really interesting structure that leads immediately to questions. So let's take a little tour of this table. Uh, in the first generation, this first column, we have the up quark and the down quark, which are very familiar to us. They make up the proton and the neutron and me and you. Also in this column is the electron and the electron neutrino. Now the neutrino is a very, very strange little particle. Now it's not strange because it's rare. In fact, neutrinos are everywhere. It's like a hundred billion neutrinos pass through your fingernail every second produced by the sun. You don't feel them because they hardly interact with you. They like ignore you. Right, they, they um, could pass through a light year thick wall of lead um, without trouble. So their neutrinos are everywhere. Now, the really fascinating thing is that the other particles, the other four quarks, for example, they are copies of these first two quarks. So the charm quark is not like some totally different weird kind of quark. It's exactly like the up quark, except it has more mass. And the top quark is exactly like the up and the charm, except it's even more mass. And this weird pattern where every particle has like two copies, two heavy echoes, that continues. The down also has these two copies. The electron has two copies. Then even the neutrino has two copies. So there's three of each of these things. There's like a lot of structure here, a lot of patterns. And we don't understand almost any of them. Right, And immediately it leads to questions like, why do we have all these other particles? What are they for? 
We only need the up, the down, the electron to make it matter. Why does the charm exist? We don't know. How many particles are there? Like we've seen 12. Are there 12 in total? Are there 12 million? We have no idea. Um, why are there two copies of every particle, right? We see this first column, which makes some sense, but why are there these echoes? Why are these, this weird symmetry? You know, it's also very strange that there's three versions of every particle because three is sort of a strange number. Like it's not the kind of number you expect to see in physics. If you go to mathematicians and you ask them like, say I was to write down the fundamental theory of the universe, what numbers would you expect to see there? They would say things like, you know, one or pi or e or stuff like that, right? Nobody would say three unless they were Catholic. And hey, maybe the Catholics are all right. Maybe three is a fundamental number in the universe, but it seems strange. It seems like there must be an explanation. We also don't have any idea why some particles are really heavy and other ones are really light. Like why is the top quark 175 times the mass of the proton and the up quark is much, much, much smaller than the mass of the proton. Um, we also don't understand the, the charges of these particles. You know, like, you know that if you put together the quarks in just the right way, you get a proton, which is charge plus one, and the electron is charge minus one. That's cool because it means you can have hydrogen, which is electrically neutral and stable and all that kind of stuff. The fascinating thing is that as, according to our theory, there's no requirement that these things balance. Like the fact that the electron is exactly the opposite charge of this combination of quarks, is it an accident? Is it a coincidence? We don't know. Or maybe it's a clue. It's a clue that says, hmm, there must be some connection between these particles that we're not aware of. There must be some reason, like they're all built out of the same tiny little stuff deep down. That must be the reason why they have to balance. Or maybe there's an infinite number of universes out there, and in many of them, they don't balance. And this one, they just happen to. So we like, like to think about how these particles interact with each other and, and to write down like a theory of this interaction. And so here's the current standard model of particle physics. And you know the goal is to develop a theory that's simple enough that you could put it onto a t-shirt. And so I would say we're, you know, we're a ways away from getting the standard model onto a t-shirt. And sometimes I feel like we are the scientists in this um, far side cartoon, you know, that we're thinking about the universe the wrong way. And so we're forced to write down things really laboriously and with great detail because we don't see the pattern, you know, and if we just spoke the right language or understood things in the right way or had a different kind of mathematics, maybe instead of looking like this, it would look much simpler. You know, the way these guys don't understand when the dolphin is saying habla espanol, what that means. And so, of course, the search continues. And I'm a member of the Atlas Collaboration. So I'm an experimental particle physicist, uh, colliding protons and antiprotons at the Large Hadron Collider, the highest energy controlled collisions in the world, which is pretty exciting. Um, and, you know, people think about, people ask about what is it like to work there? What does it look like when you see the collisions? Well, seeing the collisions is a challenge because they're so, so small and they don't last very long. Um, and so let's get a view for what the collider looks like. So it's actually just outside of Geneva in a beautiful location. Um, in the winter, you're close to uh, lots of mountains for skiing. In the summer, there's fields of sunflowers. It's beautiful. Um, and Geneva is a very nice city. And so just outside Geneva, uh, there's this facility. And underground is where the collider is. And our four points around the ring, we have these detectors, like this is the Atlas detector, with many layers of different detectors for detecting what happens when the particles collide. Now, you're not actually allowed to walk on the detector like this. This is just a graduate student for scale. Um, but we collide the particles together and at the heart of that detector and try to see what happens when things come out. So the detector like takes a picture for us of what happens in those collisions. And so, you know, the particles collide and they they generate this spray of stuff. And you don't actually get to see the collision itself. You just get to see what comes out of the collision and then deduce from that spray what you think happened in the collision. But it's a wonderful opportunity to discover new things, to figure out like, are there more quarks? Are there more particles? Are there other weird things we never understood? And for me, it comes back to this idea of exploration. 
you know, you put enough energy into this collider and you will see nature's menu. And the more energy you put into the collider, the more you can reveal from the menu. It's like having a bigger budget. You get to go to a fancier restaurant and, and uh, spend deeper into the wine list. So without knowing what nature can do, we force her to reveal her truth just by putting enough energy into these collisions. You know, you collide, for example, quarks and antiquarks, you might convert them into electrons. You might convert them into muons. You might convert them into something new, something weird that nobody has ever seen before. And that's my personal scientific dream. And you might ask like, well, what could we discover? What's possible? Well, the thing is we just don't really know what's out there. And so there's a lot of possibility to discover crazy things uh, things that haven't existed in our universe since the Big Bang. You know, I like to think about maybe that when we turn on the LHC, we would, uh, you know, be like these alien scientists turning on the universe <clears throat> and creating mysteries. But we know that there's a lot out there to discover, not just because we haven't understood the particles that we do see, but because most of the universe is not at all the kind of things that we've been talking about tonight. The things that make up me and you and hamsters and pecan pie and steaks, quarks and electrons, that describes a tiny little slice of the universe. Most of the universe, it turns out, is something totally different, right? And we know a little bit about what it's made out of. Uh, one clue we have came from looking at how galaxies rotate. Right? Think about galaxies as like a merry-go-round with a bunch of ping pong balls on it. You spin a merry-go-round, what happens? Well, ping pong balls will fly out. But that doesn't happen to galaxies, right? Stars are not being thrown into intergalactic space all the time. Why not? The answer is gravity. Galaxies have gravity to hold the stars in. So then you can do something cool. You can say, well, I'm going to count up all the stars in the galaxy. and I'm going to ask, is there enough gravity to hold the galaxy together? I can measure how fast things are spinning and I can do a pretty simple calculation, centri centripetal force, to understand how much force is needed to hold the galaxy together. So people did this and they discovered, wow, galaxies are spinning super duper fast, much faster than they should be able to and hold themselves together. But stars aren't getting thrown into intergalactic space. So there must be something else, something hidden inside these galaxies that's providing more gravity to hold these stars together, something we can't see. So that's the genesis of this idea of dark matter which is like a very dramatic name and maybe one of the most confusing names ever because dark doesn't mean black, right? You get the idea of dark matter, like some black cloud you can't see through. Actually, dark matter is invisible, right? And you should think about dark matter in terms of its interactions. Like, how do we interact with things? Well, you know, there's gravity, there's the way that, you know, you're held to the earth. There's electromagnetism. This is the thing that keeps you from like falling through your chair, uh, because the electrons in your body repel the electrons in, in your chair. There's the weak force and the strong force, which hold the nuclear to get, nucleus together and are responsible for its decay. Dark matter, we know it feels gravity. We sort of invented the idea of dark matter to explain the missing gravity. But we think it doesn't feel electromagnetism or the weak force or the strong force. In fact, we have no other way of talking to dark matter, of interacting with it interacting with it other than gravity. You know, we've tried everything. We've tried email, doesn't even seem to have Facebook. It's totally ghosted us. And there's a huge amount of it. So the fraction of the universe that is familiar to us, 5%, that, you know, made of up quarks and down quarks and all that stuff, it's not a small amount of matter you need to add to galaxies to explain how they're spinning. You need to add five times the amount of stuff that you can see. So galaxies are not like, mostly stars and gas and dust with a little bit of dark matter. They're mostly dark matter with a little sprinkling of stars, right? Stars are like the sprinkles on top of the cupcake. And it's a big idea to believe in dark matter. And so it took people a while. It took um, seeing dark matter in other ways. One powerful way we can see dark matter is by seeing it bend the path of light. So imagine that there's some faraway galaxy and between you and the galaxy, there's a big blob of dark matter. Well, light from that galaxy shooting off in two different directions will get bent <clears throat> towards the Earth and your telescope by that dark matter, because dark matter can change the shape of space and cause it to act like a lens, then bend the path of light just the way a lens would. 
So this causes something crazy. Sometimes you look up at the sky and you can see the same galaxy twice, <clears throat> which means either you've been spending too much time with the philosophers smoking banana peels, or that there's some huge blob of invisible stuff between you and that galaxy, and that's causing it to get lensed. And finally, we saw two galaxy clusters collide. Galaxy clusters have both normal matter and, of course, dark matter. What happens when they collide? Well, the dark matter, because it doesn't interact with anything except for gravity, passed right through, right? Gravity is very, very weak force, and so the dark matter can just pass right through itself. Whereas the normal matter, the, the gas and the dust and all that stuff, it smashed into each other, big special effects, etc. So we can see this, this is called the bullet cluster. We can see that the gas and the dust created these collisions and the dark matter passed right through. We can't see the dark matter directly, but we can tell by using gravitational lensing on background galaxies that it's there. And that's fascinating because it tells you that dark matter isn't just like us misunderstanding gravity. It tells you it's some new stuff. It really is matter with its own gravity. We just don't know what it is, right? Like what is dark matter? We know that it's there. We know that it has mass. It makes gravity. That's about all we know. Uh, we don't know if it can do interesting, complicated things, right? It might be that some component of dark matter can, can interact with itself in complicated ways and maybe make dark biology and even dark people, right? For all we know. Uh, there could be a dark matter physicist somewhere uh, giving a lecture about uh, the universe and saying, oh, we understand 95% of it, except for this little sliver. So most of the universe is something we don't know, um, but there's this huge piece of the pie, 68% that we haven't talked about yet. And this is something we call dark energy, but dark energy is no relationship with dark matter, except for the word dark, which means physicists are clueless about it. And the idea for dark energy comes from understanding the history and the future of the universe. So here's a little summary of what's happened in the universe so far, right? We had the Big Bang, things expanded out and formed galaxies and planets and cats. And then people were wondering, well, what's going to happen next, right? After the Big Bang, is there so much gravity and stuff that the expansion is going to stop and slow down and come back together and make like a big crunch? Or is there not enough gravity to do that and things, oops, and things are going to drift forward forever gradually slowing down, but never actually turning around. These are the two options, the big crunch or the heat death, things just spreading out forever. So they went out and measured the expansion rate of the universe using supernova, and they discovered something amazing. The universe said no to option A, the big crunch, no to option B, the heat death. They said, and the universe said secret option C, which is we're not slowing down at all. Right? We were considering two different ways the universe's expansion might be slowing down. It turns out it's not slowing down. It's accelerating, which means there's some enormous force out there capable of accelerating the expansion of the universe. We're talking about pulling galaxies apart. It's an incredible amount of energy required. And we have no idea what's causing it. Right? We just really do not know. We observe that it's happening. We see that it exists. We have no mechanism in place that can describe this kind of thing. Um, but we do know that galaxies are getting further and further away every single day, right? New space is being created between us and other galaxies. And at the very far reaches of the universe, those galaxies are moving away from us faster than the speed of light because new space is being created between us and them. Sort of like Usain Bolt is running at you and somebody's laying track in front of him faster than he's running, he's never gonna get to you. Same thing with those photons, which means like things are disappearing from the edge of the observable universe. There are things out there in the night sky we can see that the future will not see. And, you know, it's lucky that we live now and we can still see so much of the universe. Imagine being an astronomer in 100 billion years. Or think about, wow, what might have been in the sky uh, 10 billion years ago and now is gone forever. We'll never know. So here's a summary, a pie chart of what we know about the universe, right? Mostly it's something we have no idea what it is, dark energy. A big chunk of it is stuff we know it's there. We don't really know what it's made out of. It's some kind of matter. And the other 5% is something we don't really understand, but we've been exploring for a few hundred years and we got a lot of questions about. 
you know, it's sort of like this moment in physics when you realize you've been studying a tiny little detail and you thought you had the big picture, but then you realize, wow, I've just been looking at like the tail of the elephant. And if you're a physicist and you've been studying the tail of an elephant for a hundred years, and then you discover the rest of the elephant, you might be tempted to do something like, well, let's model the elephant as a perturbation on the tail or as a linear combination of tails, because that's what physics is, right? We describe the unknown in terms of the known. So what is a photon anyway? Is it like a little particle? Is it like a little wave? We describe it in terms of things we know. But that's a mistake because we're generalizing from like a tiny little slice of the universe, 5%, to the rest of all this weird kind of stuff. What we need to do is sort of push everything aside and be ready for like a revolution in physics to say, wow, we need to rethink everything. So I like to think that, you know, this is like a golden age in physics that we're our space telescopes and our gravitational wave detectors and our particle accelerators are going to lead to some dramatic new understanding of the way the universe works at the most fundamental level. That people are going to look back in 200 years and say, wow, I hope, I wish I'd been a physicist back in 2022 when they figured out all that cool stuff. And, you know, tonight we only talked about one question, what is the universe made out of? There's so many basic and deep questions that we just don't even really know how to ask. You know, questions like, what is space? Space is something that we used to think Newton thought. It was just like, it's nothing. It's the backdrop of the universe. It's the stage on which things happen. But now we know that space can do weird stuff. It can expand. It can bend. It can ripple. We've seen these things, right? Can't actually do cartwheels as far as we know. But who knows what it can do? It's some weird new kind of goo that we can't even really explain. Uh, we have no idea what time is, right? Time is a deep mystery. We know it's connected to space, but quantum mechanics says it's different from space. Uh, it only flows forward for reasons we have no idea why. Um, it's a bizarre, bizarre thing. We don't even know how many dimensions there are of space, right? We experience three, but string theory says there should be 11 or 26, but we don't see them, but maybe they're looped up. We just really don't know. These are basic questions we don't know the answer to, right? About the essential nature of the universe we find ourselves in. And I don't say that to mean like, wow, science doesn't know anything. I just say that as encouragement for young scientists out there. There's so much left to discover. There's so many basic things that we still don't have a handle on. Um, so I did write a book. It's called We Have No Idea. It talks about some of these mysteries. Uh, in a podcast, Daniel and Jorge Explain the Universe. And recently put out another book called Frequently Asked Questions About the Universe. So thanks very much for your attention this evening. And um, I'd love to answer any questions that you guys have. All right. So uh, I hope everybody can hear me. First of all, I want to thank you, Daniel. Fantastic presentation. It's, I am absolutely delighted. It was absolutely great. Uh, I saw some uh, question on YouTube and I will probably prioritize them because else I will have about 20 things. One, just one little thing is that as much as I think you dislike the name corpuscules, it means tiny little body in French. Huh? So it's not that bad, you know, tiny little thing for a particle. <laughs> It's, it's just not a very pretty word to say, you know, corpuscule. <laughs> well, I would argue that no French word is actually nice to say. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, apparently, uh, one of our students is actually uh, have, uh, is reading one of your books. So you already have uh, uh, huh? fans in here and readers. So... Uh, I also have a first question is how plausible is it that there may be other elementary particles hiding at non-tested energy levels, maybe even higher luminosity? <clears throat> That's from Merrick. Yeah, uh, sorry, the question was how plausible is it that there are other elementary particles hiding at... Non-tested energy levels. Oh, untested energy levels, yeah. Great question. Um, so there's two different ways we can look for new particles. One is, as you said, we can go to higher energies. Uh, is it likely that there are new particles of those energies? We just don't know. We have suspicions because we think there must be something else out there. This can't be the final answer. We have no concrete hints. Um, 
we have like a few clues here and there that suggest maybe, but we don't know if there are other particles out there. And we also don't know at what energy they are. Do we need an accelerator twice as big or 10,000 times as big? We just don't know. It's, it's like exploration, you know? How many more planets do we need to land on before we discover life? Two more? Two billion more? We don't know. Um, another thing we can do that you mentioned is higher luminosity. That means basically more collisions per second. And that way we could look for particles that are being created, but they're just really, really rare. So you need like a trillion or quadrillion collisions to make one of them. So that's what we're doing at the Large Hadron Collider right now. We've increased the energy a little bit from 13 to 13.6, but mostly we're going to run it out the wazoo and look for really, really rare, rare particles for like basically the next 10 years. Um, on this, actually, I think it was also referring that would it be possible that the, the particle are hiding, just like at the Stanford experiments where they finally figured out where to look at? Mm. That's a great question. So the Stanford experiment was using electrons, so they could very, very finely tune their energy. And they had to. They had to create particles at just the right energy. The Large Hadron Collider were using protons. An advantage of protons is that the protons themselves don't interact. It's the quarks inside of them. So what that means is that when you smash two protons together, you get actually collisions between the quarks inside them, but the quarks have sort of random energies. So the Large Hadron Collider has 13 TeV of energy in the, in the protons, but really it's a quark collider at many, many energies all at the same time. So it's a great way to explore with a proton collider because you're getting you're exploring the energy range up and down the scale so it's very unlikely for a particle to sort of slip through the cracks at a proton collider the way it really could at an electron collider great question okay so another question from priya how do we know after a uh, collision the matter and antimatter uh, that matter and antimatter produces an unknown intermediate particle and doesn't it become two different uh, particles? Like, how do we know there is this intermediate step? Yeah, it's a great question. What we do is we look at the energy and the momentum of the particles that came out, and we say, you know, uh, what could have made that? So, for example, when we look at the Higgs boson, the Higgs boson turns into two photons. Well, photons don't have any mass, right? But if you have two photons together, two photons that shoot out, they have momentum this way and momentum that way. And we can add that up to an, a, a momentum vector of the Higgs boson. And with the momentum and the energy, we can measure the mass of the Higgs boson. So what we do is we look at the stuff that came out and we assume conservation of momentum, which tells us what must have been the quantum state of that initial state, but in that intermediate state. So we can't see the intermediate state directly. We can just deduce what it might have been based on the stuff that came out. If we capture all the little bits that fly out, we can reconstruct the quantum state of what was there. But we never see it directly. And always what happens is that we see something in the detector and there's always multiple possible explanations. Maybe it was a Higgs boson. Maybe it was just something else that made it look the same way. You can never really know for sure for an individual collision. We have a question for Tanner. Could it be possible that dark matter is like antimatter? For instance, antimatter is virtually identical to normal matter, but with opposite charges. Could dark matter be similar in that regard? So that's a great question. A dark matter can't actually be antimatter because antimatter um, is visible, right? It, it reflects and gives off light and dark matter doesn't. But in that way, it could be, right? It could be that um, dark matter has some relationship to matter in the same way that antimatter has a relationship to matter. We see this all over the place in physics that there are these copies, right? Like the muon is a weird copy of the electron. The anti-electron is like another weird copy of the electron. So people speculate like maybe there's a whole other set of particles that are a different kind of copy of the particles we have. It's called supersymmetry. And some pe people suspect that those supersymmetric version of our particles might be the dark matter. So yeah, absolutely, that's one theory that people are considering. I have uh, another question. Uh, so Priya is saying that she can understand about producing lower mass energy particles ever after collision, but can the, can both new matter and antimatter have high mass energy, the new created matter and um, antimatter? 
Mm -hmm. And yeah, you got you more can, mass. Yeah. You can have more mass coming out of your collision than came in, right? You can send two protons together and then coming out, you can have two massive particles. Absolutely. Um, we do that all the time. And that reason is that mass is not a conserved quantity in the universe. It's not something which is constant, right? Um, energy is more constant than mass. You can convert energy into mass. And that's what we do. I think you have a kind of question you may really like. Does the disappearing age of the universe uh, due to dark energy means that we're able to look less further back in time each passing day? Absolutely. The sphere of the universe that we can see is growing and shrinking. It's growing because as time goes on, light has had more time to get to us. But at the same time, it's shrinking because the universe is expanding. And that part is winning. So the this is called the Hubble volume. The fraction of the universe that we can see is actually shrinking. And so we can see less and less of the universe as time goes on. That's kind of tragic, right? Yeah, actually, it makes me feel like we are missing out on every second <laughs> on what we could know. That's this right. information is leaving us. Every second you're watching TV, you're goofing off instead of studying the universe, you're missing out. Uh, could it be uh, could it be like non elements and are there other particles that could generate oh, I think that we're talking about dark matter and dark energy could it be like non natural elements and are there other particles that could generate but doesn't seem to appear in nature so, there are lots of particles most of the particles we talked about today do not appear in nature like the top quark does not exist in the universe normally it only exists when you create special conditions. It used to exist a lot very early in the universe when the universe was very hot and dense, high temperature. But now the universe is too cold to make top quarks naturally. And so they're only made artificially in particle colliders. That's what most of the particles are. And so probably these other particles, if they exist, heavier, new, weird particles, they exist sort of only on nature's menu. Like the universe can, knows how to make them. It can make them if the conditions are right. It's just that the conditions are almost never right, except when people get together and, and make accelerators and, or aliens do. And so physics aliens. Yes, exactly. I hope there are physics aliens. I hope we are able to talk to them. <laughs> I, <hope laughs> I think they're... that would be incredibly frustrating to have all this knowledge and be absolutely unable to touch it and grasp it. I'll just. Yeah. Uh, do you know if the Crayfish app is available for iPhone or is still available? The Crayfish app is available for Android and we're um, revamping the website right now. We have a new version of the app coming up very shortly. Uh, we don't yet have a version for iPhone because Apple devices are much, much harder to write programs for and we're a small volunteer team. So right now we're just working on the Android version, but we hope eventually to have an iPhone version as well. Uh, that will really look like. Does it look only, f it asking, it's, sorry, about this app, it's um, asking, does it only look for muon, oops, sorry. Uh, I lost my, does it only look for your muon? And did the app define the desired cosmic rays? Did you, did you make the data public yet? Cool, great question. Um, so the app will see any ionizing radiation, including high energy photons or electrons or muons, um, and that's cool and fun. And um, we are running in sort of a beta mode right now, just calibrating it and making sure it works well and understanding the data before we release it broadly. So we only have a few thousand beta testers right now. We have a long waiting list of people who want to use it, but uh, uh, we haven't turned it on yet. And um, we will release the data publicly, absolutely, uh, once we have some understanding of it. Okay, absolutely. Uh, do you, I'm curious, do you, is there a difference depending, for example, on the altitude where you're located? Yeah, the rate of cosmic rays um, changes as a function of altitude. And that's actually one thing we're hoping to use to calibrate it. That depending on your altitude, you should see a background of muons from cosmic rays, and we should be able to predict that. So that's something we want to use to calibrate these devices. Will I get in trouble with the TSA if I turn on my phone in the airplane <laughs> to check? Yes, you definitely will. So I do not, um, you should speak with your lawyer before doing that. <laughs> okay. don't, don't take legal advice from a physicist. <laughs> Fair enough. So, 
Uh, Amelia is asking, will the expansion of the universe make it more difficult to discover new particles as things move away from each other faster? Um, <clears throat> I, the expansion of the universe is something that's happening sort of very slowly on our scale. So it's not the universe is not going to change in any way in the next 100 years or 500 years or even a million years. This is something that happens on cosmological timescales, you know, billions of years. So our science is probably not going to be affected unless we live long enough uh, to have to worry about that. But, you know, before that happens, we have other problems like the sun is going to burn out in five billion years and um, it's going to get much, much hotter in one billion years. And so and we have climate change. So we have much bigger problems right now um, than dark energy. Fair enough. Uh, actually, it's funny because it's a question that's been asked by two person. Ragat asked a similar question. Um, I want to share. I think you, you, I want to keep. I don't want to keep you too long, so I'm going to ask just uh, one or two questions. Um, the first one would be: you mentioned that one of your dreams is like finding something completely unexpected, right? This thing that will just. I come from the other side, from the theory side, and my dream is more or less. Well, I told my students it's what Mendeleev did: is taking the data, putting it together and say, okay, the theory tells you, you will have a particle here and be right. And then tell uh, the theory, the experimentalist, okay, you find the mass for this particle, you're wrong. The theory says it should be, C, it should be that and to be right again. And this is, that to me, that's like, when you have a theory that does that, it's just like mind blowing. But I would, Sorry, that was just more like a good. I had a more question. Where do you see science be at the end of your career? Because you mentioned all that we don't know. And how do you how do you see it? And do you think we'll need to have an actual moment of tra transforming? When we will need another like miracle year like 1905? <laughs> I, I think that there are revolutions coming. Uh, absolutely. I think there are going to be turning points in physics soon, you know. It's an exciting time because we know very well how little we know. And that's a privilege, right? To know that you're ignorant about the universe um, because it means that you know to look and, and to be prepared. Um, what we don't know is when we'll discover it, right? Research is frustratingly unpredictable. I don't even know if I'll be alive when we understand these things or if I'll help discover them tomorrow. Uh, that's the thing about research, right? It's, um, it doesn't play along with your schedule. So I wish I knew what we'll know by the end of my career and even before I die. Like I, one of my dreams is to get frozen so I can get unfrozen every 50 years and just gotta get updated on what science has learned about the universe. Because I'd love to read like a kid's book about the universe from the year 3000. You know, all the things that we wonder about will be common knowledge in a hundred years or a thousand years. They'll be taught to children, right? Um, and so anyway, that's a fantasy, but uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, well, I think I'm going to end the stream there. I want to thank you a lot for a fantastic presentation, for a yeah great talk. Uh, I hope the student enjoyed it. I know I did. It was a true privilege. And uh, um, yeah, there we go. Excellent. Well, gonna... thank you very much for your great questions. And remember, all you young folks out there,